Good morning. It's great to be here with you this morning, and uh, we're just uh, excited and blessed. And uh, we've been encouraged by so many of you already, especially those of you who have helped us haul so much stuff from moving trucks. Uh, most of it ended up in the garage. I don't know. The garage is just, there's like a little tunnel through the garage right now. And we, and we just moved all the stuff in there. And my suggestion to my wife was that we would just throw a match in the garage. <laughs> Get rid of all that stuff. And then we can just, you know, start fresh, I guess, or, or something. I'm, I'm not sure. But uh, thank you for your encouragement and for being a blessing. And, and people have really gone gone out of their way to uh, to minister to us. Even my, my in-laws. Uh, went out of their way to, to minister to me. They drove in this morning from Marquette, Nebraska, so they're here with us this morning. Uh, my my father-in-law said, that, well, we heard you were preaching, and we were just worried there wouldn't be anyone there. <laughs> <laughs> so we drove in from Marquette so you could have someone to preach to, which is good because my sermon is entitled, 10 Things My Father-in-Law Needs to Work On. <laughs> Well, uh, I'm excited to look at our passage this morning. You can go ahead, ahead and turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 1. And, and really my, my greatest desire this morning, and, and this was uh, so incredibly reflected in what, in what Dustin had to say and in the songs that we sang this morning. I love when a plane comes together, right? Uh, my desire is that we would just see Christ. And uh, we would just be, be drawn into who he is and to remember why we, we fell in love with Christ. And I was reminded of a, a little bit of a story uh, from our family. It's, it's, uh, I hesitate a little bit to tell this because it's a little bit of a parenting faux pas. Uh, my, my youngest daughter, when she went to get her learner's permit, uh, you know, you go and you wait in line forever at the DMV and you, you do this whole thing. And uh, one of the first things she had to do was take the eye exam, which, you know, the DMV eye exam is like the easiest eye exam in history, right? <laughs> But she didn't pass it. She never had glasses, never had contacts, anything in her life. You know, my wife kind of rolls her eyes like, oh, you know, come on, like, give it to her again, you know. Finally, they said, well, you, you got to go to the eye doctor, and you have to have him sign off, and then come back. So my wife's like, okay. So we go, come back to the DMV, get in line, right? We'll go to the eye doctor. He'll say, there's nothing wrong with her eyes. Give us a piece of paper, and we'll go back. Except there was something wrong with her eyes. I mean, it's just something little. It's just that she couldn't see. Uh, you know, and uh, we, we never had any indication of this. She never, like, said, you know, hey, mom and dad, I think maybe I need glasses or I'm having trouble reading. You know, she had great grades. Like, everything was perfectly fine. I mean, the only indication was she would tell me how handsome I was all the time, <laughs> which she hasn't done since she got glasses. So, I, you know, that, that, could be, that could be part of it. So it turns out she really needed glasses. So we had to get glasses to get her learner's permit and, and, and do that whole thing. And... Uh, Sometimes I think that maybe in the church, we're not seeing the way we used to. Right? We're not seeing Christ the, the way we ought to. We're not seeing Christ as, as, as Scripture shows him to us. And so I hope this morning our, our, our eyes will just be opened, or our passion will be renewed a little bit. I'm reminded of A.W. Pink's uh, famous saying that an unknown God can neither be trusted, served, nor worshipped. We want to know our God, and we want to know our Savior and our Lord more. And Hebrews teaches me about God the Son so that I can worship him more fully. The author of Hebrews, although unknown, was known to the original readers. And we know that he was passionate about laying forth the case for Christ to the Jewish people. And Hebrews is, is written with an incredible knowledge of Jewish history and religion. It's kind of assumed in the book of Hebrews. It contains 86 direct Old Testament quotations. And the Holy Spirit-inspired theme of the book is the superiority of Christ. And perhaps the real question addressed by the book of Hebrews is, who is Jesus Christ? And some people have said that there was nothing more than that, that Christ was nothing more than a, a religious fanatic or a criminal or a con man. Now, others say he was a good teacher, a, a prophet, a political revolutionary. But Hebrews tells us who Christ really is. Look at verses 1 through 4 with me again. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his son. 
whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. There's no greeting here. There's no introduction. It's straight to the message. I think so that nothing will detract from this theme, the person and work of Christ. And verse 1, I mean, can we just pause for a second and be amazed by the simple thought uh, that, that verse 1 begins with, that, that God spoke. I mean, shouldn't we be in awe of the fact that the all-powerful God of the universe, sovereign creator, sustainer of all things, judge of all mankind, would even bother to condescend and speak to us? What a blessing. And God first spoke, it says, long ago. And so we, we remember the Old Testament canon and, and the fact that it, it had been closed for over 400 years at this time. It says that God spoke in many portions. That is, over time, piecemeal, uh, here a bit, there a bit. Now, Moses wrote 1,400 years before Christ. And Malachi wrote 400 years before Christ. But in between... Uh, many messengers of God made their contributions. David and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and, and Daniel all provided God's word as it was revealed to them for our benefit. Then it says in many ways, so these patriarchs who received the word of God, they received revelation, they received it through dreams and visions and events and, and angels and direct commandments. And keep in mind that that these descriptions of the Old Covenant here, these are not intended to be negative or disparaging remarks. We're not trying to, to denigrate the Old Testament. The, uh, I often refer to it, uh, as I've done student ministry over the years, as the fat part of your Bible, right? The part that we, for some reason, we seem to so often neglect, right? And, uh, and this is not to, obviously, in any way to tear down the Old Testament scriptures. In fact, it's incredible to think about the Old Testament and how it was written by 30-some different authors from different walks of life over this long period of time with, through, through different means, and yet it's completely unified, and it's without contradiction, and it maintains this beautiful, incredible harmony of message. You can't find unity and harmony of message. I mean, any, I mean just read a blog post. Right? The blog post is fine. Then read the comments. Or just don't read the comments, right? I mean, it's just, there's just no unity. Like, nobody can agree about anything these days. It's kind of stressful. And yet we go to the Word of God and we see this, like, thread, this theme that runs throughout Amen. of the glory of God in the salvation of man through the coming Messiah. Amen. And who else but an all-knowing, all-powerful God could accomplish something so monumental? And even with all of that, all of the greatness of, of, of the prophets and, and the Old Testament and the message there, there's still a contrast to be made here. God had spoken to the ancestors of this Jewish audience, and yet Hebrews 8 and verse 13 makes it clear that with the coming of Christ, the New Testament, the New Covenant has been inaugurated, and the Old Testament is becoming obsolete. Because a new, a better revelation has arrived. Look in verse 2. In these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. First we have the phrase, uh, in these last days. And it's actually just kind of a, a, a comparable phrase to the, the frequent Old Testament expression that we see in the end of days. Which really is talking about messianic times. And the author of Hebrews is just letting us know that that. That Christ is here, that the time of the Messiah has come. I had in my notes, uh, Jesus is calling. But not in some kind of mystical voice. Not in some kind of extra biblical, warm, fuzzy, uh, liver shiver kind of way. Christ is calling from the scriptures to us. Do you long to hear God speak? Well, he has spoken. And he speaks to us in his word. And his word testifies of Christ. 
just a, a few passages and you can try to jump around with me here or just jot these down in your notes for later. John chapter 5, verse 39 says, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. Acts chapter 10, verse 43, Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Acts 18, 28, For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. And we know Paul's famous words in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, what? According to the scriptures. What a beautiful, incredible thing to remember what we have in scripture and the message of Christ that we have to remember that God speaks to us. Have, have you ever been in this position where you just, you just long to hear God speak and, and you're tempted to cry out, no, God, please, like, give me a word, speak into this situation for me. And yet, as we do that, all the while, our, our Bible sits idle. We, we can't be so bold to cry out to God and ask him to speak to us when we have a Bible in front of us because God has spoken. And we've been given the scripture to be equipped and to be instructed for every good work, 2 Timothy says. And, and we're told to meditate it on it in Psalm 1. And, and so that we might have knowledge and wisdom and understanding we see throughout the Proverbs. What an incredible gift we have in our Bibles. Now back to verse 2. Uh, how has God spoken to us? Well, it says that he has spoken to us in his son. And so the emphasis here is on the fact that uh, because of his sonness, I think I just made up a word, Christ is superior in his very nature. And we're going to see in verse seven, uh, in verse three, rather, that uh, he's not only a son. Uh, he, he's not a son only in the, the way that we might be sons, but the Nicene Creed says he is the only begotten Son of God, God of God, light of light, very God of very God. And this is the story here in Hebrews of God come down to reveal himself to mankind. You know, pretty much every other religion in the world amounts to man's attempt to climb up to God. And only biblical Christianity reverses that. God climbing down to man. Jesus Christ stepping across the stars into Bethlehem, incarnating himself and becoming a man to live the life that we could never live, to die a death of infinite value. God humbles himself to communicate his love and to save mankind. Yeah. Through the incarnation, through the taking on of human flesh in the man, Jesus Christ. Turn to, uh, turn to Galatians 4. It's a good reminder for us. Galatians 4, verse 4. Let's look at uh, verses 4 and 5. It says, When the fullness of time came, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law that we might, we might receive the adoption as sons. And this is kind of a, a part of the picture that we have here in Hebrews, this idea of the, the fullness of time, the completeness of God's plan. It's like a, a fully ripe fruit. God's plan was fully matured at the time of the incarnation. And, and to us, the birth of Christ was around 5 BC on God's calendar, but in, in God's grand plan, it was the fullness of time. You imagine a timeline, right? You ever had to do timelines in, in school and you gotta like draw the line and you gotta put all the important dates and all the things and don't miss anything, you're gonna get in trouble, right? And, and, and every timeline I've ever seen is flat, right? But, but I think the way Galatians describes this, what I'm seeing in Hebrews regarding the incarnation, I think we need a timeline that peaks, right? That everything before Christ is looking forward to him, looking up to him. And everything after Christ is looking back to that pinnacle of history. The birth and life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the fullness of time. 
Mark chapter 1, verse 15, John the Baptist said, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. The 1 John 4, 9 says, By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. One of my favorite descriptions of this, this incarnation of Christ and this, this time of Christ's coming and the sending of uh, God the Father, uh, sending God the Son, S. Lewis Johnson calls it the greatest commission. And we have the great commission, right? In Matthew 28, Christ sending his disciples into the world to spread the gospel. But S. Lewis Johnson is referring to the greatest commission where the Father sent the Son into the world to be the gospel. Back in Hebrews chapter 1, notice the, the contrast here. Do you see those in contrast between verses 1 and, and, and verse 2? In verse 1, it says God spoke long ago, and in verse 2, what? In these last days, right? Now, in verse 1, God spoke to the fathers, and in verse 2, he speaks to us. In verse 1, God spoke in the prophets, and in verse 2, he speaks in his son. And the point is that something new is happening. A new testament, a new covenant is taking the place of prominence. And as we continue on in our passage this morning, we come to this sevenfold description of the Son. Just in case we're not in awe of him yet from what we've read so far, this is going to elaborate on the incomparable Jesus Christ. And Hebrews will just pound home the fact that Christ is superior, essentially that Christ is superior to everything and everyone associated with Judaism. And to that end, Hebrews, in Hebrews, we see the word perfect 14 times. We see titles and names for Christ that show his superiority. In the book of Hebrews, Christ is called author and apostle, captain, Christ, finisher, firstborn, forerunner. He's referred to as God and heir and high priest and Lord and mediator and shepherd and son and surety. And names mean things. Titles matter when it comes to knowing Christ better. In fact, the word better, referring to Christ, is used 13 times. I have a little thing that I call uh, the, the uh, McGrew Rule of Hermeneutics. I uh, invented my own. I'm, I'm uh, trying to get famous for this, the McGrew Rule of Hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is the, uh, the study of the scriptures, right? The, 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 the study of, uh, or the uh, art and science of Bible interpretation, right? And the uh, McGrew rule of hermeneutics basically says that uh, when you see things repeated in a passage, if something's stated and then it's stated again, or it's stated and then stated in another way, or if you see a word over and over and over and over again, uh, the reason for that is Matt McGrew. It's just that's the McGrew rule of hermeneutics. Basically, God knows that I'm kind of dense, and uh, I'm a little slow to catch on to things, and he's got to say things over and over and over again, and eventually I'll catch on. I, I think that's important. I think I should pay attention to that, right? And this is what we do with our children, right? We repeat it. Like, you know, I say something, they say, yeah, dad. I say, no, wait, hold on. Like, eye contact, you know, like, let's, let's make sure we're on the same page here. And I repeat it. Now I'm in the habit. I just, I have four teenage boys. Please pray for me. Uh, now, I love you guys so much. Uh, now, now I'm in the habit of not only do I repeat myself, but I make them repeat me. Like, say back to me what I said to you. Partly, I think it's the smartphone thing. Like, they're listening, but they're not listening. Like, I don't think they're listening. They're like, and, and it's kind of incredible. Like, I'll say repeat it back to me, and then they do. Like, how are you playing that game and seemingly not paying anything, any attention to what I said, but you just repeated it? Exactly word for word what I said. It's, it's, you guys are pretty impressive. <laughs> also, if anyone wants four cell phones, I have four used cell phones. <laughs> when we look in Hebrews, we see Christ as superior to the prophets in chapter 1. Superior to angels, and starting in chapter 1 and then again in, in chapter 2. He's superior to Moses in chapter 3. He's superior to Joshua in chapter 4. He's superior to Aaron in chapter 5 and chapter 10. And he's superior even to our father Abraham in chapter 6. Basically, the Old Testament icons were great, but Christ is better. And as we see Christ's deity and we see his eternality, we realize really that Christ is not just better, but Christ is the best. 
The first of the seven descriptions of the sun is in verse 2. It says that the sun was appointed by God as heir of all things. Christ is superior to the prophets because he's the heir of everything. And since Christ is the son of God, a son is the heir to what the father owns. And Christ hasn't inherited everything that he will at this present time. That will be fulfilled in the coming, coming messianic kingdom. When Christ will rule as king and, and, and have inherited all the nations and all humanity. When Christ sets up his earthly kingdom, you can read about this in Revelation 20. It's an incredible thing to consider. Daniel chapter 7, verse 14, says, To him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the people, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. That's pretty incredible. That's my God. That's my Savior. That's my Lord Jesus Christ. That's the one who in Hebrews, later on in Hebrews, it says that Christ is not ashamed to call us brother. That's pretty. That's a pretty incredible big brother, right? I mean, if you were on the playground and you were getting in an argument with someone, you say, oh, well, my big brother's stronger than your big brother. Well, Jesus Christ is your brother. He's the heir of the world. He has dominion and glory and kingdom. He's incredible. Now, look at, uh, look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 15 to 17. I want to show you something that I think is uh, incredibly cool, and I'm sure most of you already know. But I think we'd be missing out if we didn't look at it. Talking here about Christ being heir and, 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 and the heir to the throne and, and the kingdom and dominion and all of these things. Romans 8, verses 15 to 17. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which you cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also. Heirs of God, fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. So when we see this first of the sevenfold description of the Son, and it says that he's heir, and, and, uh, that he's an heir, we say, yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm an heir with him, right? I'm right there alongside Christ. I'm serving Christ. I'm a brother to Christ. The second thing we, we see in verse 2, the second description of the Son, the Son is one through whom God made the world. This is the supreme example of Christ's superiority because this kind of shows uh, Christ's ability to perform an action that the prophets were not quite capable of, uh, namely the creation of the world, right? Cre Christ created not only the, the physicality of the world, but uh, is also the source of its, uh, its time extent, its, its ages, and all that happened in them. And so the superior, superiority of Christ over the created means that Christ has authority over us. Romans 9 reminds us that we're simply the clay and he is the potter. Christ created the world as deity. He came to live in the world as man and one day he'll rule it as king. And so just in these couple of verses that we've been in so far, we're kind of seeing this this full orb plan relating to our Christology, relating to, to who Christ is and what the plan is regarding the Messiah. The same, uh, the same word is used in Hebrews 11.3. If you flip over to Hebrews 11.3. It says, By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. The word of God is, is clear to us. Creation was ordered by the Father. It was carried out by the Son. It was activated by the Holy Spirit. The entire Godhead is involved in the creation process. And John 1, 3 says that all things came into being through him. And apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. This is our Savior. 
Third, we have Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. It tells us that the Son is the possessor of deity. Verse 3 says he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The radiance of the glory of God. Christ radiates. He shines forth brilliantly the glory of God. You remember the story of, of Moses when Moses came down from meeting God on Mount Sinai? And, and, and he had such a glow. What did the people make him do? They, they made him put on a veil. Right? This is too much for us. Like You're just kind of like, you have the afterglow you know, of, of meeting with God, and we can't even take it. And the picture here is that greatness or that brilliance of God that is seen in the person and work of Christ because they are one. And I, I hope, I don't think, we need to spend a lot of time uh, establishing the deity of Christ this morning. I'm assuming we're on the page, same, same page on this one. But, but let's just do this. Look down a few verses to verse 8. And you'll see what I think is one of the most important, one of the clearest scriptural proofs of the deity of Christ. It's not necessarily the first go-to passage that people think of, but I love this. Of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. <coughs> and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. In this verse, the Father is speaking. In fact, this is a, this is a great verse to take friends, family members who might deny the deity of Christ. And before you even look at verse 8, just ask him, uh, you know, just look at the context. Tell me, who, who's talking here? It's very evident that God the Father is speaking, right? And he's speaking about Jesus Christ. And he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The fourth thing we have, again in verse 3, the fourth description of the Son, is that the Son is the exact representation of God's essence. So obviously this is piggybacking, this is springboarding on what we just saw. And the word for representation here is the word that we transliterate character. It's a word for uh, like, a, like an impress, if you use an engraving tool or a, or a stamp. So just as the, the imprint shows exactly what the original looks like, Christ possesses the same nature, the same attributes as God the Father and the Holy Spirit. This is why Christ claims complete unity with the Father. Remember when, when uh, Philip requested of Jesus and he said, show us the Father. And what did Christ say? If you see me, you've seen the Father. And this is why Christ called himself I am and why he claimed to be pre-existent. And this is why Christ accepted the worship of others and showed the ability to answer prayers and even to forgive sins. I always love the interaction with the Pharisees where they say, who can forgive sins but God? And I always wish there was like a little bell that went off, you know, like ding, ding, ding. You know, you got it. That's right. Yeah. Nobody can forgive sins but God. You know, it's like, it's just, like, there's just like a little step missing there, you know. Wait a minute, Jesus is God. If they would have known the McGrew rule of hermeneutics, the Pharisees would have been able to figure it all out. The entire New Testament affirms Jesus' deity. The fifth thing that we have is that the Son is the carrier of all things. We've already talked about Christ as creator, but here we're talking about Christ as sustainer. That he upholds all things by the word of his power. That just sounds pretty impressive, doesn't it? And there's much more than just sustaining or maintaining the universe. This phrase is, it encompasses the concept of, of moving everything towards its intended purpose, towards its goal. This is something that I'm desperately hoping my Nebraska Cornhuskers can do this season. <laughs> Move things toward the intended goal. Like, if we could, we could just do that, like, uh, you know, just... I feel like uh, I've been telling my sons for years, you know, they, they uh, how do I say this? Uh, this, is, this is really sad to say. They haven't been alive to see, like, incredible Nebraska football, right? That's kind of sad. But I tell them about it, you know. I tell them about it all the time. And basically what I tell them is, uh, look, when I was going to the University of Nebraska, we were winning championships. 
Okay. Now, I'm not saying it's all because of me. <laughs> right? I'm not taking all the credit. I'm just saying that I hope now that I'm back in town, right, we can get, you know, we can get things rolling again. Okay? If we have a good season, you remember that I said this. If we don't, you forget that I said this. <laughs> so here, Christ is governing. He's guiding all things forward into the future that God has ordained. And we, qu we can't thwart his plan. No one can stop Christ as he moves the world towards its intended goal. Now, we might detour from his will of desire, right? There's a sense in which anytime we sin, we're out of God's will, right? But we can never be out of God's plan. We can never escape God's will of decree. Look over at uh, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. It's a, a beautiful description of exactly what we're talking about here. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Ephesians 1.11 says he works all things after the counsel of his will. This is an incredible comfort to us. When the world seems out of control, when we feel so frustrated with something in our own personal experience, our own life, when hardship comes, when, when, when we're just frustrated by the, the direction of things, we know that there is one who is in control. We know that the God who loves us and whom we love, we know that our, our Savior, our brother, Jesus Christ, is moving things the direction that they're intended to head and that no one can thwart his plan. And by the way, it's not up to us and our Facebook posts or our tweets or our votes or whatever else it is to try to right all the wrongs in the world. It's just up to us to live faithful in Christ and to share the gospel and to try to impact people one heart at a time, right? And God's got the rest. And he causes all things to work together for his glory and for our good. Our sixth description is that the Son is a purifier from sins. His death on the cross was a perfect offering to cleanse us from our sin. And we see over and over and over in Scripture the sinfulness of mankind, the sinfulness of humanity. We, we read our Bibles and it's like looking in a mirror that just shows us uh, who we are and, and the change that needs to come. And the, the depravity of, of humanity is so clear in Scripture. Sin is this overwhelming force and we lament its presence and we lament its effects on the world around us. And yet at the same time, we are sinners, both by nature and by choice. And we're all infected by this SIN disease and we're desperate for a cure. And Christ is the purifier. And sometimes I, I fear that these themes, right, these themes of, of God's grace and Christ's death and, and our salvation and his forgiveness of us all, it just becomes kind of common to us, right? I mean, think about how commonplace this verse is to you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Is it possible that we have grown cold? Is it possible that uh, on Sunday mornings when we get to the share the gospel part of the sermon, you know what I'm talking about? Every, every sermon's got to have a good gospel in it, right? That we kind of like have this mental switch where we go, oh yeah, I know this. <laughs> I've heard this. Like, I already believe this, so this, this is not for me. We just kind of shut down a little bit. When the reality is there's nothing more impactful to our Christian life than to hear the gospel over and over again and to preach the gospel to ourselves every single day. There's so much in the death of Christ for us, so much in the work of Christ and all that has been accomplished for us. 
What did Christ do to purify from sin? Consider how great his sacrifice and, and how wide his arms were spread for us. 1 Peter 3.18 says that Christ died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. The just for the unjust. Romans 5 eight says, while we were yet sinners. Verse 10 says, while we were enemies. And even though, as the apostle John describes it, the world is God-hating, Christ-rejecting, Satan-dominated, that's the world that Christ died for. And, and in reality, folks, if we don't have this message of sin, which it seems like more and more uh, preachers are kind of bent on leaving that part out, right? I, I had an experience uh, uh, growing up in, in this city where we were going to a church, and, and uh, my, my mother talked to the pastor and said, uh, you know, you, you really should... Share the, the gospel message in your sermons. And this is, you know, almost 40 years ago now. And he said, oh, no, he said, people don't like to hear that kind of stuff. He said, they, they just come to be encouraged. And I don't want to talk about sin and, and those kind of things. Uh, they, just, they just come to be, you know, lifted up and, and you know, be encouraged and sent on their way. But if we don't have the message of sin, if we don't understand the danger that we end, that we're in, then what are we trying to be saved from? Why do we need a savior if we don't understand our sin? And it also tells us that Christ accomplished this payment for sin once for all. All the sins of all the world in all of history in one sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 27 said, because this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Hebrews 9 verse 12 says he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Hebrews 9 26. Uh, but now once at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifest to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hebrews 10 10. Through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Hebrews 10, 12, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God. Verse 14, by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. It's important. It's important for us to grab hold of and to, to understand that Christ died for all. But only those who accept him individually by faith receive forgiveness. You can read Hebrews and, and, and you can learn the, the Christology and you can have a head knowledge of the person and work of Christ all without actually knowing him in a personal way. It's the old gospel song that you might know a lot about him, but do you know him? And the word whosoever is used more than 110 times in the New Testament, you must respond in order to have the work of Christ credited to your account. I encourage you not to wait another day. Because this Christ that we're seeing is worthy of worship. He's worthy of your life. He's worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And those of you who know Christ, he is worthy to be talked about and lived for and openly shared as you go about your day. Amen. Look at the seventh description we have here. Verse three. The son is seated at the right hand of God. And the fact that Christ took a seat after his atoning work indicates that just as he said, it is finished. Hebrews 8, 1 says the main point in what has been said is this. We have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Chapter 10, verse 12, again, he sat down at the right hand of God. Chapter 12, verse 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. 
Old Testament priests didn't sit in the performance of their duties. There were no chairs in the tabernacle because the work was never final. It was never finished. But where is Christ seated? At the right hand of God. And of course, this is an anthropomorphism. It just indicates a, a position of power, a position of authority. In the Kenosis passage in Philippians 2, we see that Christ set aside this glory that he had with the Father in order to come and be this sacrifice for us. And now he's being put back in a place of honor again. Cowper, the, the, the poet, Cowper described it this way. Though once a man of grief and shame, yet now he fills a throne and bears the greatest, sweetest name that earth or heaven have known. Psalm 110 verse 1 says that the father tells the son to sit at his right hand until he makes Christ's enemies a footstool for him. That's kind of a beautiful picture, isn't it? I, I don't know why that thing encompasses in me. This is just, you know, I don't, I don't know. This might not sit well with you, but have you ever seen like a wrestling match or something? It's usually some kind of like fake thing. Sorry if you think that stuff's real. <laughs> and the guy like puts his foot on the other guy. He's like, ah, you know, like just showing his, it's just like the way to show your dominance, you know, just, just put your foot on top of the person. Well, here Christ's enemies are being made a footstool. Christ is, is raised to this position of honor and glory from suffering servant to ruling and reigning king. I mean, it's incredible. In Hebrews 1, verse 4, we'll wrap us up, is part of the same long sentence as verses 1 through 3. And it concludes with the, the thought, and it, and it provides this transition into the next section. The author is going to show the superiority of Jesus Christ to the spirit world, including angels. And verse 4 says, Having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Become much better than the angels. We demonstrated Christ is better than the prophets because he's God's son and the promised king and, and God himself. And this demonstrates his uh, this is demonstrated by his exaltation to heaven, right? So we, we, we show Christ's superiority to the prophets in the fact that he's exalted to heaven, but the angels are in heaven, right? And so now we have to show that, that Christ is not only their equal, but that he's superior. And chapter 2, verse 2 reminds us that the Old Testament word came from angels. So angels are important, right? Angels are the, the messengers of God. This is like a big deal. To claim that Christ is superior to angels may not seem like a big deal to us, but to the original readers of the book of Hebrews, this is a big deal. To the Jews, angels were incredibly important because they're instruments that God uses to reveal the Mosaic law. Acts chapter 7 verse 38 says, This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers and he received living oracles to pass on to you. In, in every period of his existence, whether in heaven or on earth, his speech, his conduct, reflected Christ's subordination to God. God is always superior uh, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. I just, I just read. I just read the uh, the wrong thing here. Um, yeah, for sure. I didn't give you a little segue here, right? Uh, it, important. So important for us to understand the deity of Christ because the deity of Christ is one of the most uh, attacked doctrines in history, right? If we go back in church history. This is something I, I really started doing with our college students: is uh, teach the controversy, right? I think it's, for one thing, it wakes them up a little bit. It gets them a little bit more excited about doctrine when they understand that some of the things that maybe they've been raised in the church to know and to teach, uh, and, and they just accept, right? I mean, yeah, everybody believes this. My parents believe this. My grandparents believe this. It's in our church's doctrinal statement. That hasn't always been true. And, and so teach them some of the controversy of the reliability of Scripture, the inspiration of Scripture, the, the humanity of Christ, the deity of Christ, and how these doctrines have been under attack. And these doctrines are still under attack. And Jehovah's Witness see Christ as closer to an angel than God himself. And so it's important passages like this that show us the superiority of Christ to the angels. 
One Jehovah's Witness publication says Jesus never claimed to be God. Everything he said about himself indicates that he did not consider himself equal to God in any way, not in power, not in knowledge, not in age. Well, that doesn't fit with what we're seeing in Hebrews, does it? We're seeing the deity of Christ over and over and over again, and even the Father himself referring to Christ as God. And in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4, it says he has inherited a more excellent name than they. A very clear distinction between Christ and the angels. And in what name is it that he's been given? Greater than the angels, and the key is to look to verse 5, the name that he's been given is the Son. And Christ has always been the Son, but that name is now being exalted. And Romans chapter 1, verse 4 says, Who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the Spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. He's declared the Son of God. He is the Son of God. And Jesus, in spite of his time of humility, is God. And this is proven by the resurrection. Where he showed his dominance over sin and over death. And this morning, in light of everything that we've seen about who Christ is and, and his superiority and, and his greatness, what should be our response? 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, we mentioned verse 4 earlier. I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And if you want to know God, if you want to have a home waiting for you in heaven, I have a one-step program for you. Believe. Believe this message of who Christ is and what he's done on your behalf. And confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe him, uh, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And if you know Christ, remember 2 Corinthians 5, that the love of Christ controls us, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. My desire is that we would see Christ for who he is. And then the result of that would be that we give him the glory he is worthy of. We give him the glory that he deserves. And we live for the one who rose on our behalf. And fulfill the purpose that we were created for. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this beautiful, inspired description of the Son. Father, I pray that we wouldn't take for granted, that we wouldn't just uh, allow these things to, to just kind of uh, fade away from our mind or, or be things that we've heard time and time again, but they, they would be motivators in our life. That the reason we desire to, to be different than the world around us, the reason that we desire to, to live a, a life that is in line with what you've laid out for us, the path that you've laid out for us in your word, that's because we love Jesus Christ and we desire to honor and glorify God. And we're so grateful for the salvation that we have in Christ. And we just believe, Lord, that it's incredible that you are our father and that we've been adopted and that, that, that Christ is our brother. And it changes who we are and it changes the way we think and, and what we say and what we do. And help us to live as men and women who have been changed by an encounter with Jesus Christ this week. It's in your name we pray. Amen. kids that are just prayers of my heart for them, what I want for them. One of the things is I want them to know that their dad uh, loves them and will love them no matter what. But the second thing is this, that 
I want my kids to know that Jesus Christ is worthy of their lives. And one of the reasons that this is the case, one of the reasons that Scripture makes this so clear is that we can trust Him. He is the God that's created. He is the God that is the exact imprint of the Father. And every one of His promises and His words we can bank on fully. There's no question. And when you go through life and you interact with more and more people, you begin to realize that you cannot do this with others. You can't. And one of the greatest things that we have in all of Christianity is that we never have to doubt whether or not the promises are going to come true. We never have to doubt whether or not God's words are true. So as we close today, I'd love for us to stand and sing, and as we sing, to think about these words. Tis so sweet to trust, to trust in Jesus. Just to take Him at His word. Just to rest upon His promise. Just to know, thus says the Lord. Let's stand together as we close. This is our Christ. He's worthy of our lives. He's worthy of our trust. Let's sing it together. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust.